Hey y'all, so on the last episode of Southern Gothic, we explored one of Colonial Williamsburg's most haunted places, the public jail, a facility that was built over 300 years ago and is now purportedly home to some of the spirits who endured its treacherous conditions. But as I mentioned then, the public jail is far from the only haunted location in Williamsburg, Virginia, a community that has existed for almost four centuries. So now, on this all-new Southern Gothic minisode, I'm going to take you to one of these places, the historic Peyton Randolph House, a building that was once the, quote, home of one of America's most prominent families. Today, many claim that the Peyton Randolph House is a hotbed for paranormal activity. And why wouldn't it be, as these claims aren't new by any means? In fact, the most famous purported witness to the house's well-known hauntings is the Revolutionary War hero and French general, Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette stayed there for two nights during his 1824 tour of the United States and is reported as saying, quote, Upon my arrival, as I entered through the foyer, I felt a hand upon my shoulder. It nudged me as if intending to keep me from entering. I quickly turned, but found no one there. The nights were not restful, as the sound of voices kept me awake for most of my stay. Who or what Marquis de Lafayette encountered is unknown, but it is likely that the answer is deep within the long history of this unique colonial mansion. As it is seen today, the Peyton Randolph House is a two-story, L-shaped building that is essentially three structures connected by walls and hallways. The original building, known as the Western Section, or West Wing, was built in 1715 by William Robertson. It features two levels, each with four rooms, all organized around a large central chimney. Then, in 1721, Sir William Randolph purchased the home, along with the neighboring property, and moved into it with his wife Susanna and their three sons, Beverly, Peyton, and John. Randolph was a wealthy and well-respected man in the Virginia colony, and he held the distinction of being the only colonial citizen from Virginia to have been knighted by the king. Several years after purchasing the properties, Sir William began construction on a second building, now known as the Eastern Section. This house was smaller, with a height of only one and a half stories, but would eventually be connected to the original structure by a center section that was built by William Randolph's middle son, Peyton, after his death in 1737. Peyton was only 24 years old when he inherited the home but his future was bright. Often described as a natural leader, Peyton Randolph went on to serve as Speaker of the Virginia House of Burgesses before playing an active role in the outbreak of the American Revolution. He then became the first president of the Continental Congress. As a result, the Randolph House became a frequent meeting place for revolutionary leaders. And in 1781, it served as the headquarters for French troops as they prepared to join the American forces in surrounding Yorktown, thereby ending the war for independence. Tragically, Peyton Randolph never saw the fruit of his labor, as he died in 1775. Following his death, the stately Williamsburg home remained in the Randolph family, until 1782, when it was auctioned off to Joseph Hornsby. 
but it wasn't the Hornsby family who became the basis of the current legends. Rather, it was the property's next set of owners, the Peachy family. Headed by matriarch Mary Monroe Peachy, the family purchased the Randolph house sometime in the early 1800s, but not long after they moved in, people began dying. One child fell from a tree to his death, and another had a fatal fall from a second-story window. Several other children died of unknown illnesses, and a visiting young man had a lethal bout with tuberculosis. But most notably of all, a family member reportedly committed suicide in the house's drawing room. Then, on May 5, 1862, the Randolph House became one of the many buildings in town to serve as a hospital following the Battle of Williamsburg, which saw 41,000 federal troops face 32,000 Confederates in brutal combat. The result was over 3,800 men whose lives were lost, missing, or wounded, with some of them drawing their last breath under the roof of the Randolph House. By the late 19th century, this once stately home had begun its descent into disrepair, eventually forcing the East Wing to be torn down. The surrounding land was gradually divided up and began to be sold off in the early 1900s. But in the 1960s, the Colonial Williamsburg Corporation took action and gained ownership of the property. As a result, the Randolph House survives today as the most original structure located in Colonial Williamsburg. It is perhaps for this reason that some believe the house to be haunted. However, as I said earlier, claims of unexplained activity are not new. The earliest reports are said to be from the late 1700s, and these incidents included a variety of phenomena. Disembodied footsteps and voices were heard echoing through the home, as well as the sounds of children laughing and playing. Some felt as though they were being watched or touched, but most notably, objects are said to have been moved on their own, and a mirror was shattered without cause. Most say that the earliest spirit to occupy this historic home is that of a young man, typically identified as a soldier, who is believed to have died there after contracting tuberculosis. It is believed that he was staying in the house while he attended William and Mary College, and some visitors claim that he appears as a shimmery or translucent apparition, dressed in colonial garb, while others attribute the sounds of heavy footsteps to a spectral gait. Of course, the most infamous apparition of all is Mrs. Peachy herself, the longtime owner of the home. It is believed that her spirit appears wearing a flowing gown and lace cap in a rear bedroom on the second floor of the house. Legend claims that in the evening, the matriarch's apparition is a warm and welcoming presence. But as the night grows darker, she grows more and more distressed, which some believe is her way of warning visitors against staying in a home where so much tragedy has occurred. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic.
Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast written and produced by Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Not only will you help us sustain our growth and continue releasing episodes like this one, but you'll receive access to special members-only content and swag. The link is in the show notes. Lucky Lady Shacks.